A very good evening to all our viewers. You're with me, Maria Zulfikar Khan, and this is The Platform. Today on The Platform, we will discuss the relevance of the United Nations General Assembly to the turbulent ties between the United States and Pakistan. Joining me in my Islamabad studios is uh, former Ambassador Mr. Khalid Mehmood and sitting uh, right next to him is Defence Analyst Maria Sultan. Pleasure to have both of you here on the platform. And now let's uh, toss over to Washington where uh, my colleague uh, Kokov Farshori awaits us. Thank you, Maria, and welcome viewers to Voice of America's Washington studio. I'm your host, Kokab Farshori, and as Maria mentioned, today we'll discuss the relevance of the United Nations in today's world, particularly to Pakistan and the United States. We are privileged to have two very distinguished guests joining me to discuss this important topic. From our New York studio is Ambassador Munir Akram. He served as permanent representative to the United Nations for Pakistan from the year 2002 to 2008. And joining me here in Washington is Mark Koteman, a senior advisor and director of the program on crisis, conflict and cooperation at the CSIS. Prior to joining the CSIS, Mr. Koteman served at the United Nations in a number of capacities for over nearly 12 years. Thank you very much to both of you for joining us here at the platform. I'll begin with Ambassador Akram. Ambassador Akram, the United Nations says that it needs $357 million to cope with the floods in Pakistan to help the people who've been affected by it. Do you think the United Nations will be able to get the kind of support that it needs to effectively help uh, the people affected by these devastating floods in Pakistan? Uh, well, I, I certainly hope that uh, the United Nations uh, receives a, a good response to its appeal, uh, perhaps a better response than it did last year. Uh, but I must say that the first and foremost responsibility for looking after our people is the responsibility of uh, our own government, uh, the government of Pakistan. Uh, the monies required are not that large uh, and uh, if it is within the capacity of Pakistan to help itself. So I believe that self-help should be our first priority. Ambassador Akram, we all know that Prime Minister Gilani cancelled his trip to the United Nations in the wake of uh, these, these floods. He chose to stay back uh, to help the flood victims or those who were affected by the floods. Do you think his presence at the General Assembly session would have helped Pakistan better in raising those funds that are needed back home? Or uh, do you think it, it really doesn't matter? No, I, I believe that the Prime Minister's presence at home is much more important in the sense of being able to coordinate and direct the relief which is required for the victims of the flood. The emergency is at home, not at the United Nations. And as I said, the amounts involved are not that large that Pakistan cannot mobilize uh, such amounts for itself. So certainly uh, the game is back home. The crisis is at home and it is a good thing that the Prime Minister will stay at home to address the crisis. Ambassador Akram, before we bring the discussion to our, our Washington studio and then take it forward to Islamabad, I would like to ask you the question that is at the heart of tonight's topic and that's the relevance of the United Nations, particularly for Pakistan. Now, in a situation like this where we need money and you are saying very rightly you are pointing out that the basic responsibility is of the government of Pakistan. The United Nations does come across as a body that is relevant in circumstances like these. If we have to ask you a broader question, do you think the United Nations is relevant, especially for a country like Pakistan? Well, certainly. Uh, of course, the United Nations is most relevant for us. Uh, but that relevance, I think, flows first and foremost from the fact that the United Nations stands for certain principles of international conduct, uh, principles uh, requiring uh, peace and security for states, uh, respect for sovereignty of states, uh, the right for economic and social development, uh, and international cooperation to this end. Uh, these are, are central features of the United Nations Charter, the objectives of the United Nations, and these will always be important for countries such as Pakistan, uh, which are part of the international community and which must depend on international cooperation to promote their national objectives. Cooperation, uh, Ambassador Akram finished on. Now, Mr. Kotterman, 
I'm not sure whether you're wondering why this question even came up about the relevance of the United Nations. But the reason why it comes up in, in Pakistan especially is because people have this perception that when it comes to the real tough issues, the United Nations doesn't have the force to get its decisions implemented and examples often quoted are of Kashmir, of Palestine. So people say that when it really matters, when the rubber hits the road, the United Nations turns out to be, if I quote the, the, the term that's used in Pakistan, looks like a toothless body. What do you think? Well, I, I think that, that at, um, at all times we need to continue to evaluate and reevaluate the, uh, uh, the usefulness of the United Nations and its ability to, to fulfill uh, the tasks uh, set out for it and expected of it by the international community. Having said that, I, I, th I think if we look at, at this in, in, in the longer term, we've been uh, conducting the, uh, the form of bilateral relations between states that we do now basically since the, the mid 1600s the creation of the Westphalian state. We've been doing multilateral diplomacy, multilateral politics since the end of the Second World War, and I think we're still at the, at the early stages of it. The UN is absolutely an imperfect body. It, it doesn't always live up to its expectations, or I should say, mo more importantly, the member states of the United Na Nations do not allow the United Nations to live up to, uh, uh, to, to its ideals, to the ideals of the Charter at all times. Um, and there are many instances in, in which uh, the United Nations has fallen short. Uh, you, you've mentioned a few. I think the Rwanda genocide was another, um, among other Srebrenica, an, another circumstance. Um, having said that, though, I think the United Nations remains relevant. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a question. I, I can't speak for Pakistan, but it remains relevant for the United States, despite the fact that some on Capitol Hill might be trying to undermine U.S. Uh, 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 interaction in the United Nations. And uh, among other things, it is uh, uh, the world's first responder when it comes to, or second responder after after governments when it comes to natural disasters like the floods. Uh, another criticism that the United Nations faces, especially in Pakistan, is the role of the United, Na the United States. It's often said that it's like a subsidiary to the United States. It does what the United States wants it to do, and for obvious reasons, funding. How correct is this perception in your opinion? Well, I, I, wish, I wish people who have that view could tell some members of uh, the U.S. Congress that, who have a sense that the, uh, the, the, the United States does nothing but suffer defeats at the United Nations. And uh, there's a bill before Congress now that, that could cut the U.S. Uh, 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 contribution to the United Nations by half. Um, I, I, I think that where you stand often determines where you sit, and that, um, it, that there is dissatisfaction with the United Nations, and really with multilateralism in general in almost all countries, except we can't find other ways of bringing about the international cooperation that we so desperately need for issues that cross international boundaries, that are transnational. Um, the, the United Nations tracking of, um, of, of international health issues, the response to natural disasters, the not very successful but still important attempts to deal with climate change are things that have to be carried out through multilateral bodies, and the United Nations, at least for now, remains the main body to carry that out. Let me take uh, this discussion forward and let Let's go to Islamabad uh, and let me ask Dr. Sultan. Dr. Sultan, um, I'm sure you hear the sentiment in Pakistan that the United Nations does what the United States wants it to do and pretty much holds it hostage. But here in the United States, the debate is entirely different. Uh, the U.S. Congress is now saying that the United States should consider its funding to the United Nations and for precisely this reason that the United States cannot get its way through resolutions in the United Nations. So these are two divergent views of the United Nations. One view is that it does what the United States wants it to do. The other is that the United States cannot get its way through the United Nations. Where is the reality in between these two perceptions? The United States has always had a very turbulent relationship with, uh, with the United Nations and I think um, as uh, it was just stated by the earlier speaker that the, in the U.S. Congress it is a question of debate always. But when, once we talk about the United Nations, the United Nations only reflects the reality which we see in the international world affairs as it exists. And as it, and as it exists, United States is a unilateral 
you know, naturalist power with, uh, you know, now the sole superpower in the world. This means that they exert a lot of pressure and influence in other bilateral relations and then consequently affect behavior vis-a-vis -vis, um, those states' behavior in the United Nations. And in addition to this, it's also a question of they picking and choosing which organs of the United Nations they would like to strengthen and which organs of the United Nations they would want to be expedited in terms of how things are, um, are perceived or done. Here I would like to give an example of how the UN Security Council has, has with increasing time become a much more, uh, much more used body by the United States uh, in, uh, with respect to the other United Nations bodies such as the UN General Assembly. And we all know that the UN Security Council needs a lot of restructuring. There's a big debate about it, whether or not it needs to be restructured, whether it is all encompassing, whether it can, should be based on a P5 principle, on the principle of veto. And similarly, when it comes to actual multilateral diplomacy, uh, like uh, something which Ambassador Munir Akram had been very uh, familiar with, like the Conference of Disarmament and others, that's where they find that the United Nations is not as um, forthcoming once it's actually incorporating the views of all the state members. And so this is a pick and choose for the United States, and that's why this perception is seen in Pakistan or, or maybe in other parts of the developing world, that when it comes to getting sanctions from the UN Security Council, so when it comes to uh, coming where the teeth is, when it comes to resolutions under Chapter 7, that's where the U.S. influence comes or is seen most visible. But when it comes to actual relief efforts, when it comes to much more generic principles, whether it's in uh, global uh, change on environment or, or on or other uh, like climate change or other things, that's where you see the U.S. help being less more visible to the United Nations. And I think uh, this is something which we need to see when we're talking about U.S.-U.N. relations right. and consequently the perception on ground. Ambassador Mahmood, uh, I'd like to ask you that uh, we're talking about the effectiveness, the relevance of uh, the United Nations. Now, I'd like to ask you how effective do you think is the United Nations General Assembly when we talk about, when we specifically talk about the Muslim world? How effective is it? Uh, see, uh, I think uh, your question uh, stems from the fact that uh, uh, two important issues before the UN uh, which have been hanging fire for the last uh, uh, 60 years or so. Right. Uh, they relate to the Muslim world that is uh, Palestine and uh, Kashmir. And both these issues uh, were brought before the UN soon after its birth and uh, they have not been settled. So there the, if you go by that and the current development also you know the situation in uh, Iraq or uh, Afghanistan uh, and previously in uh, the Balkans, you know, uh, all, uh, at all these places, it was the Muslim people or Muslim nations which were suffering and UN was not delivering uh, as was expected of it. So there I think uh, the uh, grievance of Muslim people is uh, legit legitimate. But on the other hand, one has to see that uh, what is the nature of uh, United Nations organizations. It is not a world government. It doesn't have uh, army uh, at its command. It doesn't have financial resources of its own. It cannot tax even a single person in the world directly. So given and that it is uh, structurally is uh, so designed that uh, big powers, uh, the five permanent members have a controlling uh, position in these organizations and uh, nothing can happen without uh, uh, their consent. So given these uh, all constraints, uh, one should not expect that uh, UN would be able to uh, deliver e in each and every situation. But right. on the other hand, the UN involvement in Muslim causes also has not been without some uh, benefit also. Just think, you know, uh, for example, Kashmir. Of course, ideally, the, the United Nations uh, should have uh, been able to help solve this problem. Now, as regards the principles, the United Nations did lay down the principle that through its resolution, the Security Council has affirmed that the solution of this problem is through the exercise of the right of self-determination by the people of Kashmir. Now, what else the United Nations can do? It has. But it's all about getting that right or helping those people achieve that goal because isn't that what the United Nations is supposed to do?